Today I'm going to show you how to make a custom waterform case. I'm going to be making this case for my phone, so here we go. Before we get started, remember that I've been putting both the patterns and artwork for my latest builds on my Etsy shop. You can uh, find the link around here somewhere, check that out. Also, if you haven't already, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you don't miss any of my videos. So before you all panic that there's a piece of wood involved in this build, you could waterform around your phone. I think overall it would be more difficult. Maybe wrap your phone in saran wrap. Uh, it'll be hard to keep it in place, but you could do it. So uh, I'm just showing you the way that I would do it if I was going to make a product line. So if I was going to make a bunch of phone cases, this is how I'd do it. If you want to put saran wrap around your own personal phone and wet mold leather over it, I take no responsibility for anything that might happen to it. I don't think anything will, but you never know and I am not going to be responsible. So while I've been rambling, we've cut out the phone, we've sanded it, and we've sanded it a little more to get a little better shape. So we've got a kind of phone case shaped piece now. Now we're going to drill some pilot holes so we don't split it and then we're going to screw it into this other piece of wood. That gives us a good base to work off of for molding and why it's instantly superior to like saran wrapping your own phone. It's hard to make your own personal phone have a solid place to sit on. And then we just shake the leather and that creates water, boom. So we're gonna mold it around the, this uh, fake phone. These are a bunch of tools that you could use. I specifically like this one. I've only had it a little bit, but it's nice and narrow, so it's uh, but very smooth and round, and it glides really well, so it's great for molding around edges. I like to put these nails right in the crease. You could put them out a little further and avoid the holes. I go back later and try and remove the holes with some burnishing, so it kind of it works out. I just like how it keeps it nice and tight to the thing I'm molding around. I try and alternate nails and keep it even, so I'm evenly nailing it in around on both sides. Obviously the corners are going to be where it's the hardest to mold, so you're going to have to work it a little bit. Make sure you push it down, rub it, push it down some more. Eventually it'll get to where you want it. I See I'm like really going to town on the corners here. Also I forgot to mention that when I wet mold anything, I run it under hot tap water first. I don't put it in cold water. It's always hot tap water. I don't, it's not boiling water, it's just hot. Now that we got that done, we're gonna let it dry. We're just going to speed through the drying process here, little time lapse, and then we're going to start pulling the nails. Now you can even tell that in the crease, it's still pretty wet, so we have the chance to still mold the holes away once we've pulled the nails. So I get most of them, they're, most of them get pretty small. So we just go around the whole edge, removing nails, burnishing and wet molding the edges to get rid of the holes, and giving it a little extra once over to make sure our uh, all our parts are smooth and flat and don't have a ton of marks on them. After we've pulled all the nails and done our burnishing, we're going to let it dry a little longer and then we're going to line up where we're going to use our four hole punch because I'm going to hand stitch this one as well. So I've marked where I want my four holes and then I cut it, measure it, and cut the other sides. I made sure I measured where I was putting the four hole punch because I don't want it rubbing on the side of the case when I punch my holes. So you don't want it too tight, you want it a little bit away. So that's pretty good. Probably could have beveled the top edge before wet molding it, but whatever. You don't need to bevel the sides because once you stitch it together, it's going to be beveled and burnished um, as a single piece that's being put together. You'll see later. Now we're just measuring out our flap. It's a little long. I fold it, cut it, and then I shape the flap to how I like it. Draw a little, uh, little curve. It's a little big at first, so I trim it down slightly and that works for me. Fire a stitch groove all the way around the edge so we can line up our holes and then fly through all our holes. I use a little wax there to make the hole punching go quicker. And right there I used the four hole punch to measure the distance and then used a single punch on the corners just to make sure I had it right. And this actually lined up perfect, I was pretty happy. Also you see there that I started at the top and worked down to the corner and then started at the top on the other side and worked down to the corner and then did the bottom 
That helped. That just makes sure everything lines up along the edges for me really well. The bottom I could fudge if it was off, but I'd like the ed the uh, two sides to be perfect. So both the tongue keeper and the belt loop keeper are working within how the four hole punch lines up. I want a hole on the outside of the keeper edge to stitch down to the leather as well. So you'll see here, there's four holes on the front of the pouch, but two on the keeper because it's going to overlap to the edge and stitch down. It just looks better and it's stronger. I wasn't sure if I was going to add a separate tongue because I liked the idea of how it might uh, look when it was stitched on. I decided to make it one piece. It's a lot simpler, a little more low profile. So I added that on, quickly cut out the back. And once the back's cut out, we just need to bevel it. No, punch holes. Well, that was close. So I'm just marking all the holes because I want to make sure it's perfectly lined up. Then I just do the same thing on the back with the hole punch to make sure all my holes are the same or close to it. Then we bevel it and then we're going to line up our belt loop keeper on the back. And this one's going to be wider than the keeper on the front, but still it's going to line up with the four hole punch in mind. So there's the four holes on the strap itself and then there's two extra holes on the belt pouch and that allows the stitch to go off the edge of the loop and stitch down stronger onto the pouch itself. So there's six holes there. This is perfect, exactly what I want and then the four hole punch will perfectly line up across both the top and bottom of that keeper. Boom! Done. Exactly what I wanted. Fly through some artwork magically create a serpent really quickly. Honestly, I tried to draw a wolf and I couldn't, so I went back to a serpent. Maybe some other time. I did a lot of extra stuff on the drawing itself. I'm not going to carve all the extra tiny little lines I did that you'll see here. So the same pattern I use on the tongue, I use it in the body of the serpent, and I use it on a lot of my serpents. It's just, a, it's very time consuming, so I really didn't want to carve all that. Once the artwork is all done, we're going to transfer it onto some tracing film and we're going to wet our leather and get it onto the leather. Once again, we're blowing through this process. There's lots of videos on this. We don't need to see this in real time. Make sure your leather isn't too wet. Let it dry a bit, cool to the touch, transfer your pattern on, and then swivel knife and beveler. I didn't background at all this time. I did, once again, I did just the beveler around the edges and it worked really good. I really need to practice doing something other than serpents. They look good though. This one turned out well as well, so I'm doing something right. Just need to work on stuff like wolves, ravens, boars, you know, all the favorites. Then we carefully and tediously paint with dyes. And when we're done painting with the dyes, we're going to use the dye to finish off all the rest of the pouch parts. And we're going to come back and hit the carving with a finish. Well, finish and resist. We're hitting everything with a finish, but we're going to use that finish as a resist for the carving. And when I get around to the resist, I end up using um, neutral resiline again. It seemed to work really well last time, so I decided to just go with it again here. So you don't make a mess of your edges. Be sure to burnish them before you put a finish on. So you're going to put the wax on, burnish. There's a bunch of different burnishing tools you could use. Then after that, you're going to buff out any excess wax or whatever burnishing compound you used. And then after that, we can hit it with a finish. A spray gun is one of those investments that it took me a long time to get, and it is really well worth the money. So if you get a chance to get a spray gun, get a spray gun for your finishes. It's so much easier than streaking it with sponges and awkward applications. Put a little too much antique gel on, but better, better too much than too little. I don't want it to be uneven. I'm being a little messy, but uh, whatever. 
Looks good. Now it's on to hand stitching the uh, loops on, doing the back. It's a pretty straightforward uh, running stitch all the way down to one end and back and then knot it. And we're going to do this with artificial sinew on both the belt loop and the tongue loop at the front. So, a few knots. and eh, messy back. I should have dyed that darker. But nobody knows but us. Blow through the stitching here. And then the uh, front of the pouch, we're going to do the same thing. Running stitch down and back, knot it with the artificial sinew overlapping off of the edge of the keeper. So it makes it a little stronger and looks pretty cool too. I like how those look when they're off like that. I'm using four times the length of the uh, holes in artificial sinew. And I'm going to this time do a saddle stitch all the way down to the other end and then tie it off. I'm just using two needles and alternating back and forth all the way around the edge of my project. And then when I get to the very end, when I go through the end with the needle, I want to go through and come out on the inside of the pouch. And that way I can tie a knot off that's hidden on the inside of the pouch. You'll see when I get around the edge here. Every three or four holes or so, make sure you're firmly cinching that uh, stitch down. So you don't want any loose stitches because if you have a loose stitch way back, it can be quite a difficult process to make sure it gets all tightened. So here we're getting to the end and I'm going to stitch up to the very end and back and then between the two pieces of leather and out on the inside, like right here. There we go, boom. So pull that all the way through and then we're going to take the other end of the thread and work its way up and then weave it as well into the inside of the pouch. And then we just need to double knot it and cut it off. Random note, the inside of my pouch is a bit messy but you can see some wax on the edge. So just go, make sure you get both sides when you're uh, burnishing. So I went back and fixed that up later but you don't notice. Then I'm using my sander to get any excess off. You could carefully cut it with a knife, but it can be tricky, so be careful. Then we're going to bevel it, then we're going to dye it, then we're going to put wax on it, and we're going to go over to the burnishing machine, which works a lot better for projects, uh, parts of the projects like this, and make it nice and smooth and almost look like it's one piece. See, it almost looks like one edge, like there's no seam. Ah, it turned out pretty good. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, hit the notification button so you don't miss any future videos, and check out my Etsy for both patterns and artwork. And until next time, keep on being creative in whatever it is you do.